Let's now talk about monitoring performance because we need the equipment to be always running optimally and the IS auditor wants to make sure that the equipment and the services and the processes are being monitored. There needs to be a performance monitoring plan and not just for hardware but also for software. In the case of hardware or software or processes we can look at historical data, we can look at event logs and reports. We just need to know that there is a plan to keep an eye on it. Now in larger environments people will probably have live monitoring consoles. They'll use things like System Center or some other product to monitor service or server or application performance and there will be dashboards right there showing if something's running well or not. And usually you'll at a glance be able to tell. And if, if there is some kind of issue, you'll be able to see at a glance, you, you click in it and you drill down until you actually get down to the actual problem. We want to, as IS auditors, know that people are keeping an eye on the systems and keeping them running properly. Now for monitoring, we'll be monitoring hardware and software. We'll be monitoring applications and we'll be monitoring the network as well. Like an example here, if we just take a, a quick look at an example in Windows itself, we can see that all Windows operating systems have a performance monitor and the servers have their own performance monitor. And if we click the performance monitor, we can add certain counters. So we can add maybe um, processor and we can look at not just processor, but like all CPUs or all cores on the processor or we can add specific cores. Usually if you don't know what you're monitoring, monitor more broadly and then narrow it down. And so we've added all instances of the processor and then maybe we can go to memory and we can uh, take a look at memory. We can add that. Usually when you are just doing general monitoring, you're monitoring processor, memory, disk, network, and then from there you're drilling down to applications and um, specific functions of an application like maybe a DHCP server, you're, you're monitoring numbers of um, uh, lease requests and leases granted. Or maybe for a SQL server, you're monitoring numbers of procedures and triggers and uh, you're monitoring numbers of queries and numbers of deadlocks. And um, so anyway, we will add just a couple of these and then we'll just watch in real time. Obviously, you only watch in real time when you're trying to actually watch something happen. Instead of keeping your eye glued to this all the time, you'll probably want to set up a log and um, have it collect in the background, which we can take a look at. So we could create a data collector set, and we could define a data collector set. And we could right-click this and create a new data collector set and we just call it whatever we want and we can manually create it or there are some existing templates and I want um, performance counter information or give me an alert when something happens and um, I can add a couple of counters like maybe I can add processor and click OK and then I can see that how often will it sample now I have to warn you when you are collecting this sort of stuff automated you got to realize that wherever this log is going to be, it's going to grow very, very quickly. And so now you've got to manage the performance of the performance monitoring tool itself. And it will have its own databases or its own logs that you have to manage. So we'll, we'll leave the sample interval at the default and leave it in the location that's the default. And we can um, start this right now. And we can let it run for a while and we go back a little bit later and, and we check it. At some point or another, all system administrators and network administrators are going to be monitoring throughput, workload, um, performance, failures. Uh, you're going to monitor, monitor all this, and the IS auditor wants to know that you are monitoring these things. And usually what will happen is there will be logs, there will be something going on, something has happened, now the auditor wants to see, can I see the logs? Can I trace exactly where this failure occurred? Can I go back in time and look at the failure? Because very often it will be a domino effect. First one thing goes, then another thing, and a whole bunch of other things go. And so you trace back to find the, the original thing. And when we're finally done, after it's collected some data, at some point we'll just run some kind of report here. And nice thing about um, Windows these days is that 
you can automatically have reports made. Now this is but one example. In something, in a, a larger organization, you're going to have far more sophisticated monitoring systems where you'll have a central console polling different servers and different devices for their throughput, their CPU temperature, their, their, their workload, um, the number of users connected, uh, how many uh, security incidents they've had, failed logons, how many leases were given out from a server, how many queries, whatever, and then you can, like I said, tell at a, a glance. And so we can see right now that this guy is collecting data for his report. So these are all things that the IS auditor wants to know that the uh, operations team is doing regularly. And in case there's an incident, we need to be able to go back and look at all of the data and um, have the data sort of gone through, sifted through to find exactly what it is that we need. One of the reasons why we monitor for performance at all is for capacity planning. We all know that at some point we need to add more disk space. We need to buy a newer and bigger server. We need to add more switch ports. We just need to capacity grow. Management doesn't take too kindly to you suddenly saying, oh, we just ran out of disk space, and you suddenly surprise them with this. They want to know well in advance to plan for the budgeting. So when we, when we capacity monitor, we first set a baseline. Okay, we, we, let's find out right now what is the current workload of this system. And let's look for any bottlenecks. And a bottleneck is basically one area that holds up every, all the other areas. So um, maybe the switch is too slow. It doesn't have enough ports. Maybe the CPU, it needs more cores. There's not enough RAM. So we'll, we'll catch some, we'll do some performance monitoring to see if different, um, um, uh, different counters are within acceptable levels. And it really depends on the system, but there are some very common things like a lot, a lot of folks figure if a CPU is more than 75% busy all the time, it's time to upgrade the CPU or do less work. If the uh, memory, if the amount of available physical memory falls below um, maybe a, a certain percentage, um, I don't know, 15%, or the number of uh, pages per second, like um, we don't have enough physical RAM, so we're paging out to disk. If that's more than 300 pages per second, or um, if the disk is uh, more than 50% busy, um, and, or if the network is more than 60% utilized, or, or whatever, whatever works for you, um, and, and all the vendors have different recommendations for their products, then once we, we clear out any of these bottlenecks, then we capture a baseline of expected server performance or, or network traffic or something like this. Once we have that baseline, then we can track the trends over time and, and we just recapture over time. Then we can go to management and say, you know, at this rate, because we keep adding more users or we keep doing more jobs, at this rate, in six months' time, we're going to need to buy this, upgrade that, expand that, do something. Management appreciates this kind of well in advance warning so they can plan it in, as part of their, their purchasing and their budget. And the IS auditor needs to know that the operations team is monitoring and tracking trends and using performance monitoring not only to make sure the system is working well but also to track trends. Now sometimes you might be looking at um, performance and thinking, oh, you know, this thing is performing so poorly. And then, then there will be arguments about, well, what's the, the root cause of this? Like, I remember getting into a whole argument one time. Um, we had these reports that were running very poorly. I mean, it would take like two weeks to run a report that should have taken a half hour. And the arguments, there were arguments all over. Some people were saying, it's got to be the hardware. You know, there, there's just got to, we need more hardware. And I wasn't convinced at all, so we went and did some performance monitoring and, and captured some um, information. Wasn't the hardware at all. CPU was like 7% utilized, hardly any, um, a net, uh, hardly any network traffic because it was an internal report, hardly any memory use utilization, and we're saying it's not the hardware. It, well, it turned out as we went farther and farther, then we went and we said, okay, how's the application running? And we were finding that we were as we, we used some automated tools to check to see the performance of the application. And we could see that just to run one thing, the uh, code was written so badly that instead of doing a, a procedure once, it was doing it like 100,000 times because it was just poorly written in the way it was written and the way it was accessing data. 
So you need to be able to produce these things so you can hunt down what, what's the deal? What, why is the performance so bad? And the IS auditor is interested in knowing that this is being tracked and captured so we can look at it later on. So when we are talking about capacity management, we're looking at um, what is the utilization, past, present, and projected future of CPU, RAM, uh, communications, the network, how many new users, new tasks are we adding, are we adopting new technologies, and also, if we're outsourcing any of this, what about, um, is this being covered by our service level agreement, or if we're the outsourcer, even within our own company, like we're supplying a service to another business unit, what is our expected service level? Um, what, what do they expect of us? There are some capacity planning techniques. In a lead strategy, you ramp up way ahead of time in anticipation of uh, expanding your market share. And like maybe you'll buy more inventory or you'll ramp up by a whole bunch of servers or you'll ramp up your capacity or your, your um your inventory or whatever it is that you have so that you can get customers. The risk, of course, is that you end up not using it. Uh, lag strategy, it's not until we're at full capacity, then we increase. And this is a lot more conservative, but it means that we can't seize opportunity as quickly. Or we can have match strategy where we're trying to stick with a trend and where we're basically tracking and trying to stay with it. That, that's a compromise, a good balance. In software inventory, some good practices there are, first of all, you do need to inventory the software you have, and there are plenty of tools that will go out and inventory it for you and inventory the utilization of the software. You need to have it so that you know you're in compliance with licensing. Or, hey, nobody's using this thing that we bought, so why are we still paying for it? Or, um, we're going to need a whole lot more licenses because, or a whole not, lot more copies or whatever because we're hiring 50 more people. So um, we need to be able to have software inventory, but it depends on the organization to the level or depth. Just please make sure that you keep track of the actual licenses and you don't inadvertently throw them out. A program library is basically a repository to save clean source copies of your software. And it could be application source code, it could also be job control statements, it could be processes that you're doing, it could be uh, specific configuration parameters, but you want a clean authoritative place that's controlled by somebody other than the IT people. So you'll have somebody who's like the custodian all of, the, of all of this, um, or, or, not, or maybe not controlled by um, someone who's not out of IT, but controlled by like one person so that people can't just run in and grab software and inadvertently mix up copies or um, inadvertently uh, introduce a bad version. The, so the control uh, functions, uh, the library control uh, software functions would be, we don't, we don't want programmers modifying good clean source code uh, or changing objects in, in the, um, the software. Uh, we want programmers to submit a um, source code change to a specific control group. We want to uh, make sure that the um, library is updated and that you only have read-only access anyway to that source code. And we have specific naming conventions so we always know what we're looking at, looking for. We don't accidentally bring a, a beta thing into a production environment um, and that we're always enforcing certain programming standards. The next thing we're going to talk about is executable and source code integrity.